to the session. So welcome um, to today's webinar. <clears throat> today's speakers include Neil Jacobs, who will be chairing today's session. Uh, Neil is head of the Open Research Programme. Alice Hower is the Orca at Liverpool and co-lead of the ORP EDI work. Tim Newton is joining um, as the UKRN Institutional Lead at King's College London, and Tim has led the ORP training team in 2023 to 24. Anna Wozniowska is Orca at Surrey and is project manager for the OR4 project. Welcome to those who are joining as well. Um, Evangeline Gowie is an Orca at Reading and is project manager for the Sharing and Integrating project. And lastly, Lavinia Gambelli is Orca at Bristol and is project manager for the Evaluation Design Project. Um, so welcome to everyone who's joining and uh, thank you to our speakers for joining as well. And um, at this point, I'll hand over to Neil who will be chairing today's session. Amazing, thanks very much, Dolly. For those of you who haven't met Dolly, uh, that was uh, Dolly who's the UKRN coordinator and has done a magnificent job putting this and the other webinars together. So thank you very much for the introductions, Dolly. Um, as she said, I'm the head of the UK Reproducibility Network's Open Research Programme, and I'll uh, give you a little introduction uh, to that, just to uh, sort of frame and, and uh, introduce uh, what the other speakers are going to talk about, uh, going into a little bit more detail about the various projects that, that make up that programme. Um, I'm going to share a slide, as you might expect me to. Um, so. Accelerating the uptake of open research practices is what the program is about. Here's our agenda for today. So I'm going to give a little introduction. I'm then going to hand over to Alice to talk about uh, EDI in the program. Uh, Tim's going to uh, give us a summary of where we've got to on the training program and Anna on the reward and recognition part of the, the program. We'll then have a little break and then we'll have Evangeline on how we're working to enable uh, our partners to share practice through a living website and Lavinia on how we're evaluating the progress that we're making. I'll say a few words about open research indicators and about sustainability. And then I think there'll be time at the end for a Q&A and discussion. But uh, if you have questions as we go through, uh, then please do uh, put them in the chat or, or um, I hope there'll be each of the speakers today will uh, give you an opportunity after they've spoken to ask any questions specific to, to what they've said. So please do uh, think of uh, questions that you might uh, be interested in asking Alice, Tim, Anna, Evangeline, Lavinia or myself as, as we go through. So I hope that's all okay um, and what you were expecting and uh, signed up for. So the Open Research Programme, as I say, this is a programme whose strapline and, and aim is to accelerate the uptake of high quality open research practices. Um, I'm grateful to um, Ruth Davis from King's College for the use of this slide. One of the main ethos of UK reproducibility is uh, sharing and learning and using uh, materials and resources from each other. So in the spirit of that, thanks very much uh, to Ruth, this is a better slide than I've managed to put together for the Open Research Programme, so I'm very grateful to her for being able to use it. Uh, the UKRN is a peer-led organisation, a peer-led consortium, um, bringing together grassroots researcher communities, institutions and stakeholders across the research sector. And if you like, our flagship activity at the moment is this Open Research Programme. And its three objectives are to deliver high quality training, um, deliver a framework for evaluation and to enable sharing of effective practice and promote the alignment of incentives. And you will hear something about all of those things as we go through today. There are now 24 partners in the Open Research Programme. We started with 18 and, and six have since joined, which is great because they you know, don't necessarily get part of the grant money that we got from Research England by joining, but they see the value of being a part of the programme anyway. So that's really gratifying. We have 12 other partners. Many of those are involved in delivering the training. Runs for five years, started in uh, 21, was due to end in 2026, but we've got a, a one year no cost extension, so it will run into 2027 now. And most of the funding comes from Research England and from the partner universities and institutions with some contribution from the Scottish Funding Council as well. So that's a sort of overview of, of the programme. 
Um, it's made up of five projects, um, and those are the projects that you're going to hear from today. Uh, training, evaluation, reward and recognition, sharing and integrating, and management and sustainability. And the key sort of people around uh, the program, because the program is very much made up of people, um, I'm going to pick out here the, the institutional leads. Um, now you're going to hear from Tim today, who's the institutional lead at King's College, but clearly there's 24 institutions that are partners, the 24 in institutional leads uh, uh, that are part of the program. Uh, and the Orcas, now Dolly mentioned Orcas as she was introducing some of the people today. Orca is an open research coordinator and administrator. This is a special role that we sort of established within the program. I mean, we say established, I think these sorts of people were very much in place in many institutions already to coordinate activity within institutions related to open research. Um, so they have a special role in the program, both to deliver um, the, the main projects, the five main projects, that I've just outlined, but also to help and enable that program and those projects to land and be delivered locally at their institutions. So if you like, these, these orcas, these uh, uh, open research coordinators and administrators are absolutely central to the, the delivery of the, the program throughout, uh, throughout its uh, operation. So that's an overview of the program. Um, and now, I'm not going on to open research indicators. I'm going to talk about that later. I'm going to stop sharing now. Uh, are there any questions about the program as a whole before I hand over to Alice to talk about uh, equality, diversity, and inclusion? No. We can come back to any questions at the end, uh, but you're obviously keen to uh, hear from the people who are actually doing the work. So Alice, are you okay for me to hand over to you? Yeah, that's great. Thanks very much, Neil. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna share my screen. And hopefully that should be the full screen slide. Um, so yeah, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about EDI and the Open Research Programme. Um, we've kind of got this at the beginning of this session so that we can think about EDI as it relates to all of the various different projects within the programme throughout the, the rest of this session as well. Um, so just to reiterate really what Neil said, uh, the Open Research Programme is a, a big a uh, big programme with lots of moving parts and there's lots and lots of people involved. So there's people at that institutional lead level who are often more senior members of institutions. There's the open research coordinators and administrators embedded kind of on the ground at institutions and local network leads who are the kind of grassroots um, academics working within those institutions. And as part of that programme, we've got five projects um, that are all doing lots of different things within the programme that are impacting lots of different people within um, the ac research academic community. Um, so management and sustainability, um, looking inside the programme, looking after everybody involved in the programme, but also representation within the wider community. Training, um, the training project, who you'll, you'll hear more from Tim um, later on, is looking at developing training for people within the institution, obviously institutions, obviously that impacts a lot of a wide variety of different people within the institutions, but is also impacting the people working within the programme who are figuring out how to engage with people in institutions to develop and support that training. Evaluation design team who are looking at um, assessing uh, open research across all of the institutions involved within the programme um, and also evaluating the programme itself and understanding how um, how the programme is affecting people both inside and outside of the programme and how the impacts on people inside and out of the programme might affect how successful the programme is. Sharing and integrating, which is kind of our our way of showcasing our work, which obviously has considerations around representation and um, lots of other uh, things within the community and supporting people within the community. And then, of course, reward and recognition, which is uh, supporting institutions in rewarding and recognizing people within those institutions and obviously might have impacts on how people and which people are rewarded and recognized within those institutions. So hopefully you can imagine just how many different potential both positive uh, uplifting people from various different diverse backgrounds and um, the program can have but also potential unintended consequences on a wide variety of people within the research community and um, so obviously uh, from from our perspective 
EDI is incredibly important to, to thread through all of these projects and um, to make sure that we're doing the best that we can in terms of um, supporting uh, people from a diversity of backgrounds. Um, so when the programme was uh, devised, um, there were a number of commitments that were made in that initial application for funding. Um, and so these are the commitments that are taken from the business case. Um, we have uh, a number of them related predominantly to the training project, management and sustainability project, and the reward and recognition project. And we're pleased to say that, that all of these are either complete or in, in significant progress. Um, but what we want to do is deliver on these EDI commitments and then go beyond those because we want to be doing the best that we can um, in terms of supporting the community when it comes to um, diversity and inclusion. Um, so the ones that we've we've talked about uh, so far in the programme are making sure that we have a diversity of backgrounds within the train the trainer trainers, and you'll hear more about what train the trainer trainers are uh, from Tim shortly, um, to liaise with institutional EDI leads to refine the training model and to collect EDI data for the monitoring and evaluation of training. All of those are in progress. Um, in terms of management and sustainability, that's embedding uh, EDI guidelines supported uh, using the EDIS guidelines um, to uh, make decisions with the core manager group and the steering group. Um, for the ORP team, the Open Research Programme team, to frequently refresh that, refresh that EDI training and to appoint EDI champions within the projects and to appoint a UK and EDI advisory committee, which has been uh, established already uh, as part of the programme, but is actually supporting the whole UK um, on EDI on all things EDI. Um, and then in terms of the reward and recognition uh, project, aligning incentives that are already being trialed at institutions. Um, but as I say, we want to go beyond that. And so um, myself and my co-lead, uh, Ruth Davis, based at King's, um, have uh, been looking at a, a lot of different uh, elements within EDI to um, improve and uh, grow and develop our EDI provisions within the programme. Um, so we started this piece of work uh, at the end of 2023 with um, some scoping work. We spoke to the EDI advisory committee, which had been newly formed at the time. We took a paper and presentation. We spoke to them, got their advice, their thoughts on what, what we should do. And then we started planning some meetings with the project leads. Um, we had those project lead meetings and we developed some templates for a quality impact assessments for each of the projects and work together with the project leads to um, do a first kind of phase one uh, version of those equality impact assessments, which are now completed for all of the projects. Um, so we're very pleased with that as a starting point. But of course, we want to um, get some consultation on those equality impact assessments to make sure that we're thinking about things from lots of different angles. So we decided that what we would do would have some would be to have some workshops with institutional EDI leads. So there's lots of institutions involved in the program. And um, we reached out to EDI leads at those institutions and we developed some workshops. So we ran three workshops and uh, we've pulled out some summaries and actionable suggestions from those workshops. We've got a lot of really useful thoughts. And we're now in the process of taking those suggestions and using them to develop some recommendations that can be given to the projects, to the core management group and the EDI advisory committee to both get their thoughts on those recommendations, whether they are feasible, whether they are um, things that we can resource within the programme. And then we will use that as guidance to, to go forward with the programme. And we also want to refine those equality impact assessments with the, uh, with the project leads. Underpinning all of that, we've been trying to think about the literature when it comes to EDI and particularly open research. Um, and so we've been kind of keeping on top of that literature as best we can. But what we would like to do when we have a little bit more capacity is write a short paper on that as well. But of course, the priority is the things that we can actually action. Um, uh, writing a paper is is something we really want to do, but, um, but we want to make sure that we're underpinning the open research program with uh, work that is really useful. Um, so I'll talk very, very quickly um, about the quality impact assessments that we've done so far. Um, so the way we did those was to then uh, get consultation within the project. And then we want to get that consultation outside the project, take the actionable suggestions. And then we're going to go through this prioritization process, speaking to the advisory committee, speaking to the core management group. What can we actually embed within the program reasonably, um, knowing that we want to be able to resource the things that we want to do and have it uh, Thing, goals that we can actually uh, affect. And so to do that uh, external consultation, we held three workshops um, with institutions from the programme. We had 17 participants, 11 institutions, and over 50 actionable suggestions. So this is why we need to then go through and refine some of those suggestions and make sure that we can embed them within the programme. Um, 
our goal is to use that consultation and that guidance to improve practice, to be always growing. This isn't just about kind of being perfect and beating ourselves up if we're not perfect. It's about step by step building and improving what we do within um, within the programme to improve our EDI considerations and to make sure that we're thinking about things every step of the way. Um, so I'll finish very quickly by thanking there's lots of people involved in this project. Um, my co-lead Ruth, who can't be here today, uh, is absolutely fantastic and has been uh, an absolute uh, wonder at this project. And of course, what's really important for me about the Open Research Programme is just how passionate people are about the, the community that we work in. So uh, lead uh, Neil uh, and all of the project leads, Neil, Marcus, Tim, Candy and Stephen have all been really supportive of this work and we've got great people embedded within the programme. So we've got uh, three EDI champions and Dolly, Leslie and Jackie, experts at 11 partner institutions who've been really supportive and given us lots of advice. And of course, the advisory committee have been, again, really supportive and given us lots of advice. So um, it's been it's been very there's lots of people involved and it's it's been really positive, I think. So I'll stop talking there. If we have time for a question or two, um, then happy to, ha to take them. We certainly do. Any questions for Alice? I think there's one in the chat from Fiona. Um, she asks, are there any monitoring mechanisms in place to pick up on unintended consequences? Yeah, so this is something that we're thinking a lot about uh, now. Uh, as particularly within the evaluation team is how can we think about um, various elements of uh, particularly diversity. It's something I'm very passionate about when it comes to the trainers in particular. We're training a lot of people to do additional work as part of their jobs and we need to think about how we can consider whether we're training the right people, whether we're giving the support to the right people. As for what those mechanisms are, that's still kind of in process and if you have any suggestions then please do throw them our way and we'll we'll take those into consideration thanks could you stop sharing alice and then we might be able to uh, i'm not quite sure if i'm missing hands that are being raised thank you right. anything else on uh equality, diversity, inclusion, which clearly threads its way through. And it may well be that once you've heard from the other speakers today about the work that's going on in the various projects, that you might want to come back to Alice and have some questions about specifically you know, how EDI is, is being looked at in, in those projects. Zoom has just told me I'm speaking in Spanish, so I'm hoping that that's not the case. Um, Okay, in which case, uh, let's move on. I think, Tim, you're up next and you're going to talk to us about the training work. Thank you very much. I'm just going to do the usual complex sharing thing. Let's see. And as traditionally, uh, as is traditional, I have to say, can you see that? And yeah, uh, judging by Alice, is it Alice? We're good. Thank you, Alice. Um, in sharp contradistinction to Alice's um, beautiful slides, mine are um, very, very bland. And um, I think it's an interesting, interesting aspects of the two people. And apologies to those who find text difficult. Um, I love text. I'm not very good with images. OK, so I want to talk to you today about the training element, which um, Alice has so very kindly um, presaged. Um, and I want to talk about three things, sort of looking at what, how we are currently providing that training through the Open Research Programme, thinking about what, a little bit about thinking about what a sustainable model would look like, like beyond the Open Research Programme. And as a result of that, kind of ask you some specific questions, um, hopefully to get your feedback um, and thoughts about how we're doing and what the future might look like. And I think that's really important that you give us that because you're the ones that are experiencing it on the ground. So um, as Alice said, it's a train the trainer model. And for those of you, I'm sure you're all familiar with that, is that we provide some training to individuals A, B, and C, and they undertake to um, deliver the same training in um, 
their own institutions, the little purple dots. And we call the yellow dots, we call those T3 because they train the trainers. And then the purple dots is the what we call a T1, the trained individuals. Um, and this sometimes gets a little bit complicated. So if I slip into jargon of T3 and T1, that's what that is. Um, and hopefully I'll try to avoid jargon too much. So that means because we're doing a train the train model, we have a kind of two elements to our training. One is a kind of pedagogical um, approach. So what's it mean to be a trainer? What is good practice in training? Um, how can you better deliver your training and reflect on your training to optimize the quality of your training? And then the other is the content. Um, and when we talk about courses, I think we tend to focus on the content, but there is also this T3 element of kind of helping people to deliver, to develop their own way of tra delivering training. Um, this is this beautiful picture. Um, it is a picture. I did have a picture. That's good. Uh, it's not my picture. Uh, is about the content of our training. So we have different uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven elements of open research with parts, uh, components within each element. So there's an element of planning, open research, conducting, analyzing, disseminating, et cetera. Um, and we've uh, developed a schema so that we can think about the comprehensive nature of the training we delivered. I'll talk more about that as we go through. So in terms of how we deliver training, there are seven elements. So the first is to think about what we call the provision. And that's what courses are we going to provide? And we have um, two elements to this. The first is the content, which is drawn from that schema that I've shown you. We also undertook a priority survey. So we asked the community what would be their priorities. Uh, and then we used that, those priorities to identify training that we could deliver. And as we go through each successive round of training, we're trying to get more and more of the elements from that schema included in our training. What I would say is that it appears to us, and thank you to the training group who are all watching from one room today, um, it seems to us that there's been a, a, a very popular move to having introductory courses initially, and that in these later rounds, what we're finding is moving toward, more towards those introductory courses plus some kind of specialized elements. Um, and I think that's important because if you think about it, perhaps most institutions need some, uh, some people trained to deliver what open research is, what it looks like, how you do it. But that as that becomes more normalized and more prevalent, there will be a need for more specialist applications. So you might be interested in data management, but then suddenly you want to know about data management for qualitative research or data management for security sensitive research. So that's an element we need to think about in terms of sustainability. In the future, we're probably going to have to provide more specialized courses. And also about provision, we have providers. And we think about two providers. One is external agencies, external to UKRN, and then internal. So we have a wealth of expertise within UKRN. What, um, how can we draw on that expertise to be providing training in a collegiate and a collaborative manner? I'll probably read as that. So the next element, having thought about what we want to provide is, is scheduling that. Um, and that probably has two elements. One is our training team liaising with the provider to see um, when they would be able to deliver, what the content's going to be, what the um, uh, outcomes would be, et cetera, et cetera. And we draw that together into a pro forma. Um, and that pro forma forms the basis for advertising the course um, and recruiting to the course. There's also an element of uh, kind of just scheduling that and releasing that in each round, which brings us on to recruitment. So once we've advertised the course, we need to recruit people to participate on the courses. We've done, so far we've done three rounds of training provision. And in each one of those rounds, I think it's fair to say we used a different approach to recruitment. Um, we started off by asking institutions, what's your strategy for recruitment? What we found is that there are 24 
um, institutions involved and probably about 26 ways of prioritizing who attends the course. So some places like King's, we open it for everybody. Some places uh, such as, for example, UC Health um, have a much more strategic way of doing that. They would identify individuals who they think would be able to deliver training in the future and where there are priority areas for open research and different institutions having different approaches. So that's led us to thinking, actually recruitment's probably best done at this point at the local level. And we asked in the last round, we asked Orcas to coordinate that. Um, from our perspective as a training group, that went very, very well. We, we were extremely grateful to the Orcas for coordination that activity. And it seemed to us to be a really good way of balancing the needs of the institutions with the central processes of recruitment. However, I know it wasn't always easy for orcas, and I'd really love to hear more of your experience of that and the feedback about what could be done to help with that. So if, if you could um, you know, give us feedback and give us your thoughts, and um, you know, the only way we're going to learn is if you give us honest and faithful feedback uh, that will help us change. So that's how we recruit. Then there's the delivery element, which is fortunately almost the easiest bit. So um, those people are recruited, attend the courses, they, the course is delivered very kindly by the providers. Um, and then we have completion. And completion is not always as easy as it might seem. So for many courses, courses I've been on, you attend the course, at the end of the course, there might be a feedback form. And once you've done your feedback form, that's it, you're considered completed, you get your certificate. Or in our cases, you can also get badges issued um, uh, and you would join our community practice, more of which later. Um, but for other courses, there are requirements in the course. So for example, you might attend the course, complete the feed, uh, fill in the feedback, and then there might be a requirement for you to deliver training or to have some reflective practice or something. And when you've done that element, then you can complete the course. And currently, um, checking for course completion is being done by the providers who then let us know and we can issue a statement of completion and the badges which um, uh, we deliver through Steve Burnham who, um, who set that, that up. We also ask everybody who's attended the course whether they would like to attend our community of practice. Uh, and then this has been led by Steve Burnham and Joe Cornelli. Um, I think this is a really exciting in, in initiative. We currently have 79 members um, and our goal is for that community to become a self-governing, self-directing community. It is your community uh, for you to decide how you want to use it, what you want to do, what would be valuable for you. And I suspect that will evolve as the community gets bigger. But um, I do know that they've had a couple of events, um, one of which was uh, looking at how best to deliver training and kind of understanding better what it means practically to deliver training. And some of the other uh, community of practice events have looked at sharing um, what people learned from courses and bits that were unclear and discussing that, which is, again has been really useful. And I think these are things that you can uniquely do through a community of practice. So incredible initiative there. Um, we also have sharing of materials um, currently, that's being done rather informally, but we hope that once the Living website is set up and up to date and running in a few months, that will become the repository, not only for the T3, the train the trainer materials, but if you take that material and you develop it and you do new things with it, we would love you to upload that to the Living website so that we can all learn from each other which is, as Neil said, underpins the UKRN approach. Final two elements, and thank you for your patience so far. So um, there's feedback, and feedback is about how good was our course. On the day, was the course good? Um, and so we have a structured approach to that. Um, so far, that feedback for the T3 courses has been very, very positive. Um, some elements about giving us some feedback about what people did or did not understand as a base, um, as a kind of base level of knowledge, 
And as a result of that, we've introduced into our recruitment um, elements, our scheduling and recruitment, a kind of guide to what the course assumes you already know. And that's been really, really useful feedback to do that. Um, we will also be encouraging people when they deliver training at the institution to give, to seek feedback, but that feedback will belong to you and your institution. And we would encourage you to do it because it's all part of learning, but we don't want to have, um, we don't want to be getting that information. Finally, there's evaluation and there's an, both an evaluation stream um, and an internal evaluation that we are undertaking as training. So in terms of the evaluation theme, we have two targets, and I always get this wrong. We are looking to train 180 people. Uh, we're well on target for that. We have 113 people, 113 training instances that have been completed and 127 booked. So we feel we're doing well. But um, we hope by the end to have 180 training instances delivered. Um, and then we're hoping that those people who've been trained on those courses will go on to deliver 2,700 more training events. Not, not events, but training to 2,700 individuals. Um, and we have a question about how we're going to do that, which I'll talk about in a minute. In terms of the internal evaluation, we're also looking at some questionnaires about um, how knowledge, understanding, and intention to um, practice open research changes as a result of the training we've delivered. Okay. I think the challenge, personally, I think the challenge for the next few years, and Neil's already hinted at this and we'll be talking about this later, is thinking about how we move to a sustainable training uh, delivery model. And I think there are three aspects to this. One is this move to a peer-to-peer -peer provision. Um, there's so much expertise in the UK, and as I say, could we use that as a basis for training in a collaborative way? I'd love to hear your feedback on that and your thoughts on that about whether your institutions would be interested in doing that. Um, there's also that how we would collaborate with other external agencies, particularly agencies that are interested in training as well. So we might want to think about that. And then there's just how do we go from uh, this funded training program to implement it as part of the UK REN? And I know that Niels do some work um, looking at that from a specific implementation framework. Okay, my questions to you. And the immediate ones are, I'd love your feedback on the role of orcas and institutions in selecting individuals for training. Um, I'd love to know more about um, the feedback mechanisms that you use locally and how they interact with ours. Um, and uh, I'd like to know more about what you think about our plans for evaluation. And in particular, we have two challenges. How will we count the 2,700 people locally and what's the best way of counting what delivery has been treated at institutions? Um, and is there a local mechanism for evaluating what those people are learning? And just in terms of sustainability, we have this tension between, do we bring in the role centrally or do we ask people to do things locally? The ORC has been a good example of that. And how do we optimize implementation? But I suspect we won't get to answers to those sustainability questions today because that's a project that I know Neil is really interested in doing. So thank you very much for your patience. I'm going to stop sharing and hopefully you'll have lots of questions for me. Uh, how do I stop sharing? There we go. Terrific. Uh, thanks, Tim. Um... So there's, there are one or two questions in the chat, uh, which we can come to, um, but there's also the questions that you've thrown out um, to people. I wonder whether, just thinking about, um, you know, the respective roles you were then asking us to think about of who selects, who goes on the training, whether that's an institutional decision or what the various roles are. I mean, are you able to have a, you know, set out some of the, your thoughts on what the pros and cons of different approaches are from the experiences that you've had over the last year? Um, yes. Uh, so 
the pros, so the good things about the institution making decision is that they can, um, oh, they can, the institution itself has control of who's coming. Um, they can think about what their priorities are. Um, and also, for example, if I, there's a person I know in the office next to me, and I know that that person's going to be responsible for training lots and lots of people in open research, then that's a good person. I can identify that person. Whereas if five people from an institution applied centrally, we wouldn't know who is going to be delivering lots and lots of training. So it does allow institutions to do that. My concern is burden. Um, and it's, it's the burden on the orcas who, um, as I think I said in an earlier meeting we had, I don't think orcas are sitting around looking for things to do. Um, I think they're all very busy and it's an additional request on their time. Um, and it off, I think it also requires quite a lot of liaison, perhaps with the institutional lead. So the pros and co those are essentially the pros and cons from, from my viewpoint. Okay. Also, if we do it centrally, um, we, have, we have questions of allocation. So you take some place like King's, we have we're quite a big institution. Should we get more places than a smaller institution? You know, some of those questions are quite difficult. Yes, they are. Um, Tim, we've, we've had a request that can we have the um, questions up on the screen? Maybe as a compromise, you could put the questions or your questions to the, the oh. group on, in the chat or something. I, I, I won't share them. Yes, I'll do that. Amazing, thank you. Um, so there was a question from Andrew here, which is um, while, we're, while we're waiting for people to sort of have a look at those questions and think about them, um, does the training program create open educational resources? And if so, where might I see them? Great question. Yes, they do. Um, everybody who provides training is asked to make their resources open. Um, they will ultimately go on the Living website. At the moment, I would need to ask the amazing Louise, who I know is listening, um, what we do with Louise or Kirsty, both amazing, um, where those go. If they're there and can reach a microphone, or put it in the chat. How do you access the resources? They've disappeared now. Obviously, I had enough of hearing me speak. Hello. 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 Does everyone hear me sing? So just to check the sound quality. That was our, that was our announcement. Yeah. Um, so at the moment, we are, there's a combination of racing for the website, so we have a place to put them, which we're working with the fantastic Evangeline on. And um, Informally, things are being shared via the mailing list as well. I know I'm sharing stuff that come out of training via the mailing list. Uh, so there's a, there's a kind of dual way of doing it. So there's either informal via the mailing list and then also preparing for things to be shared by the website. Yep. Does that answer the question? Yeah, it certainly answers my question. Um, so it's not a straightforward route at the moment but will become so and presumably the backlog will go onto the living website once it started and do we have a kind of approximate timeline i know it got moved back a bit and steve v is on the call do we have a timeline for the living website um i think at the moment we're in a how long is a piece of string situation i'm afraid because we're just trying to sort out contracts so the intention was to launch in September. That's always been our intention. Um, and we thought we were on track for that, but um, the usual uh, sort of delays with procuring um, a, a new supplier with, with an institution as the lead, um, it, 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 you know, these things, they take time. So we're, we're coming uh, to, to towards a conclusion, I think. Sorry, I've just been told I'm speaking Spanish as well. Um, Dolly's been very helpfully assisting me with uh, coordinating between um, the uh, various different groups that want to be uh, involved at Bristol, um, myself and then uh, partners at OER Commons. So it seems that it's all starting to pull together, but I, 
I don't want to oversell it and uh, sort of say that we're going to be done in a few weeks because um, it could be a few months, you know what these things are like. Um, yeah. But certainly we, we intend to have it done as soon as possible. Um, and if there are any uh, dependencies on us in the meantime, um, we can look for solutions as well because we're using uh, things like GitHub to host uh, web-based resources. So that if, if you have a dependency on us and you need to host an open educational resource um, before we're able to provide OER commons to uh, to support that, then we, we can work with you to try and find a way to do that. Oh, thanks, Steve. No worries. Any more thoughts on Tim's questions, which you can see there in the chat? Any preferences which way we might go on answering those questions, which would suit your institution or uh, your experience better or worse? I think I can say having chatted to a few of the orcas that there's definitely some orca feedback that will be uh, filtered through to you the best way possible if, if uh, that's welcome. Always welcome. Thank you, Alice. As long as it's not in Spanish. Um... I don't speak a <laughs> word of Spanish. <laughs> Unless Zoom is telling me that I am speaking Spanish. Apparently it's doing that. All right, we're we happy to, to move on. Please do, yeah, if things occur to you on those questions, please do let us know. We're keen to get this right. So thanks very much, Tim. Um, and now we're going to move on to think about reward and recognition. This is the uh, our last talk before the break. We're going to have a break uh, in 10 or 15 minutes. But in the meantime, Anna, would you like to talk to us about the work that's going on on reward and recognition? Mm, yes, I will. Thank you, Neil. Let me just share my screen. There we go. Uh, can everybody see my slides? Yep. Marvelous. Yeah, not, not yet in presentation. Oh, yes, there we go. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, okay, so uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to present uh, the OFL project. Uh, today. Um, so uh, for those of you who are new um, uh, and haven't heard about this project before, uh, OR4 stands for Open and Responsible Research of Reward and Recognition. And uh, myself and uh, my group of colleagues are working on uh, exactly that, Responsible uh, Research Reward and Recognition for Open Research uh, Practices. So I uh, have a pleasure of project managing this uh, project. And uh, I would like to start off by presenting who the OR project, OR4 project is and what we do. Um, so behind the OR4 project, we have many dedicated people who are working really, really hard on making um, on uh, the outputs of the project and making them a reality. Uh, so we have a working group of 13 members, I believe perhaps 14 now, uh, because we've had uh, people joining very recently. And these people come from various UKRN institutions. They are both academics and professional services colleagues. Uh, currently, the group is chaired by Professor Candy Rowe from Newcastle University, whose tenure as chair of the group is coming to an end. Um, and we will have a new chair very shortly. Uh, we also have a 16 member advisory group uh, who we consult regularly on uh, various aspects of our work. Uh, they are a group of experts in the field of responsible research and assessment uh, in the UK and beyond the UK. So uh, we are really lucky to be able to use their expertise um, when, our, when we're developing our resources and our outputs. Uh, we are also working with a group of 14 case study institutions and a wider group of 36 community of practice institutions. I will explain uh, the difference between the two in a minute. 
but these institutions basically are working with the project to help develop and refine the project resources and provide case studies for our resources but also they have the opportunity to network and work together and share good practice um so Obviously, as, as was already mentioned today, the OR4 project is part of the wider open research program. And we share the same goal of uh, accelerating the uptake of uh, open research practices. Uh, the way we're doing it is by improving reward and recognition structures and practices or rather helping institutions to do that. Um, so we, we aim to support UK universities to improve their reward and recognition of open research practices to accelerate uh, the uptake of open research by researchers. So how are we going about doing this? Um, there are a, a few aspects of our work that I want to briefly go over. Uh, so first of all, we have spent a considerable amount of time trying to understand the context in which we're working. Um, because there is obviously we are not isolated in doing this work. There are a lot of projects uh, both in the UK and abroad who are working on various aspects of, of this work and there were uh, projects in the past as well. Uh, so we've um, uh, myself alongside with uh, my colleague Evangeline, who I believe is on the call, um, have led on their development of a landscape review of related work and projects, uh, and this will be shared publicly as an online database in October and will be updated periodically. It will basically, uh, well, it will do what it says on the tin. It, it's a landscape review, so a review of the context in which we're operating. Um, further um, work has gone into uh, looking at what UK universities are doing in the area of reward and recognition for open research. Um, and my colleague Robert Darby from Reading uh, University has led on a survey and a review of current practices in UK universities around the use of responsible metrics and reward and recognition processes for open research. Uh, the survey ran from spring to late uh, autumn last year and your institution might have taken part in this survey. Uh, we published a report from the survey in March 2024. It is openly available on OSF, so if you haven't read it yet, I do encourage you to have a look at it. Uh, the report presents a really detailed picture of the current UK landscape, makes a number of recommendations for both um, UK institutions and funders, but also for the OR project, OR4 project itself, uh, as to how to support progress in this area. Um, as I mentioned, uh, also we have the International Advisory Group. Uh, we are planning to meet again with the group in October 2024. Um, now, my colleague Karen Desbro uh, from Cardiff University is leading on um, the community of practice uh, deliverable. Uh, so basically, we've built a community of practice uh, to facilitate uh, practice and policy sharing across UK institutions. Um, we have 50 universities working with us uh, and uh, they form a community of practice within which we have 14 uh, what we call case study institutions which are working with us a bit more closely. So they have some commitments to the project such as they promise to, uh, to pilot our resources, provide feedback on the resources and provide case studies uh, that will help illustrate our guidance documentation. Um, that go, that is um, part of the toolkit that we're producing about which in a minute. So it's it is a big and growing um, group of uh, institutions. Um, we have had so far three meetings with the community of practice and case study institutions, uh, which were all really well attended. Um, and throughout the spring and summer. Um, this year we engaged uh, with this group uh, to test and develop the resources and toolkits that we're, we're hoping to produce as the main output of the project. So um, these institutions piloted the resources, they gave us feedback, um, and I'll, I'll talk to you in a second about uh, how that all went. Uh, so um, the toolkit is the main output of the project. Uh, and the toolkit, as we call it, is a set of resources 
which is meant to help institutional leaders and managers improve local policies and practices. So what goes inside the toolkit? It's a maturity framework which helps, um, which sort of uh, maps out the different levels of maturity um, uh, or progress towards recognizing and rewarding open research. Um, with the maturity framework, there is a guidance documentation and also a self-assessment um, tool, which basically helps institutions run a self-assessment activity, which um, provides a benchmark of where they are on that journey um, of um, towards rewarding um, open research. Um, so we shared our toolkit with the community of practice in January 2024. Uh, we are planning to publish the resource in October 2024, uh, provided all the infrastructure is ready. Um, throughout the spring and summer, we've run uh, briefing and debriefing sessions, uh, which we offer to case study institutions as part of the commitment to support them um, because they, they've promised something to us. So we're supporting them um, a bit more closely than the sort of wider community of practice institutions. Uh, and we've had a really good engagement uh, from both the case studies and community of practice institutions. Um, so we had six case study institutions that requested briefing or debriefing session or both. Um, we also had at least eight institutions completing the self-assessment exercise, at least eight institutions told them, told us that they did. Um, and the universities are also uh, offering feedback on resources and providing case studies. So, for example, we've received feedback, detailed feedback on resources from over 16 institutions. Um, so, as I said, we're planning to publish these resources in October, so coming up really, really soon. Um, and that's the sort of the first version of the resources. They will be published as an online resource. Uh, and the plan is to keep um, refining and uh, improving those resources until the end of the project. Um, so just like the whole program, we are really keen to evaluate what we're doing uh, and making sure that we're getting this right. Um, so as I mentioned before, we've run a survey in... Um, in 2023, uh, with institutions telling us about uh, where they are on the journey to reward open research, and in general, where they are uh, on the journey to, re uh, to reform um, reward and recognition. Uh, what, we, what we are planning to do is to rerun this survey in 2026 and hopefully compare the results. Um, our hope is that we will see progress between these two um, time points. Uh, we are also tracking progress with individual case study institutions. So um, we have asked our case study institutions to provide their institutional profiles to tell us a bit more about what they're doing in the area of reward and recognition for open research. These uh, case study profiles are published on our on the website and you can have a look at them. And what we're planning to do is to update those profiles annually. And by doing this, we will be able to track progress of these case studies case study institutions, hopefully. Um, and finally, our plan is to widely share resources and learning. So uh, we've got our project website where we share news and resources. Uh, we are planning an online event to launch our resources and that is planned for the 19th of November this year. And there is a registration link, um, which I can share hopefully in the chat or maybe a bit later. Um, I don't think I'm able to do that. Um, there is also a plan to have an end of project event. Uh, we are attending conferences and workshops. Uh, for example, we will be there on Monday at, in Warwick uh, to present some of our work at the Research Culture Conference. And we are engaging with uh, New UK University through, through Coara National Chapter. Uh, so we are trying to be active in the area of um, of reward and recognition uh, for open research so that people know about our work and uh, are engaging with the uh, with the project. Um, if institutions would like to join the community of practice, it is also still open and we are uh, still receiving inquiries from universities to join. Um, so how to find out more and stay in touch. So as I mentioned, we have a web page on the UKRN website um, and it, it is updated regularly. 
Uh, so that that's where we will publish where we publish our resources. The plan is to obviously move this over to the living website once it exists. But at the moment, it's there. We also have a mailing list. Uh, the link is there on the slide. If you would like to receive updates from the project, um, please join the mailing mailing list. As I mentioned, we have an online event on the nineteenth of November, and. Uh, both myself and my colleague Robert, um, more than happy to answer questions. Here are our emails on this slide. And that is me. Thank you very much. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Amazing. Thank you very much, Anna. What I'm going to suggest, if that's all right with you, because uh, we're coming up to two o'clock now, is that we take a short break now and that'll give people a chance to think of some questions uh, reflecting on maybe your presentation, but also how that might relate to the training and the EDI presentations that have just been done. I think there's some really interesting ways of thinking about those things together. Uh, who is it that gets, you know, do, do trainers get rewarded and recognized? And if so, is that all trainers or are there some biases in there? I think there's some really interesting questions in there. Um, so let's take a short break um, and uh, grab yourself a cup of coffee. Have a think about what questions you might like to ask Anna or Alice or Tim. And then we'll move into the, uh, after that into the second half of the presentation. So back in, what should we say, um, 10 minutes, I guess. So back at 10 past the hour. Right, hello. Um, welcome back, everyone. I uh, hope you managed to grab a coffee. I made the mistake of looking at my emails. Um, so yeah, uh, before we went on the break, I sort of suggested that we might want to have a think about um, some questions that might relate to the quality, diversity, inclusion, the reward and recognition and the training and how some of those things relate. And you might also have some specific questions for Anna and the presentation on reward and recognition and the OR4 project. So on either of those things, uh, anyone want to bring any questions or comments either in the chat or, or please raise your hand. Alice. Yeah, so a question for Anna, um, uh, and it's something that actually came up in, in one of our EDI workshops, but I don't think it's just related to EDI, I think it's a, a bigger question around how reward and recognition works in the wider community, but have, um, have OR4 got in place any thoughts or considerations around um, the kind of mobility of academics, if academics are working to improve their open research practices, to get rewards and recognition within their current institutions who might be case study institutions for OR4, but then move to another institution who aren't associated with OR4. Is there kind of any thought around how that work can go on to be rewarded or recognized at a, at a new institution or the impact of that? Um, yeah, it's a really good question. And that's a question that is not, not just the OR4 project that's thinking about, but it's something that is uh, widely debated within the sector, because obviously uh, you don't want to create a situation where researchers are encouraged to do certain things at one institution uh, and perhaps spending their valuable time doing that. Well, it doesn't count once they move somewhere else. Uh, I think it is much, much bigger than, than OR4, uh, this question. Um, and obviously, because researchers move not just within one country and within institutions within one country, but, but also internationally, um, you know, we, we're hoping that something uh, like like a rewarding open research uh, is going to be rolled out internationally. And there are obviously looking at uh, at various initiatives happening in the UK and abroad that's something that a lot of different bodies are working towards. Um, we have to keep that in mind, obviously, so that we're not disadvantaging people and suggesting that, you know, they focus on something that, um, you know, is, is, not, uh, is not going to be rewarded by somebody else. But at the same time, um, it's important that we don't just make open research about reward and recognition because it's again it's wider uh, so so the hope is that that researchers will do that anyway and reward and recognition will be something that will further incentivize it um so i i, I think that's a bit of a wish wish you was she answered your question but yes it is something that that definitely is at the back of our minds um, and one of the barriers that that was mentioned um, in the survey, actually, um, 
was that, you know, it is very difficult to reward and recognize open research fairly because it's not just about different institutions, but it, it's also about different disciplines and how uh, well established open research is across disciplines. So if you have, for example, criteria that are general for everybody, um, then what do you do if you have uh, researchers who do open research to larger or um, lesser degree because that's that's uh, how established open research is in, is in their discipline. So, so yeah, it's a big question. Uh, I don't think we've got ready answers and I don't think anybody does, but uh, it's something that we have to keep uh, at the back of our minds at all times. Yeah, great question. Thanks, Alison. Thanks, Anna. Uh, anyone else got any thoughts on, on that? Yes, yeah, thanks to the training team for the, that point in the chat. I mean, it is becoming a, a co common expectation, sometimes a requirement, uh, and sometimes those expectations and requirements need quite a lot of translation into a particular kind of research practice or setting. Um, hi, Andrew. Can't hear you, Andrew. Sorry. Obviously, this is the UK research, Reproducibility Network, but uh, UK HEIs also work globally. So um, one of the concerns about um, open research in particular is that uh, the criteria that are developed may not be easy for researchers in other settings to follow, just you know, extending the answer you just gave about other disciplines and so on and so forth. So how much has... Um, uh, how much does UKRN's EDI uh, activity consider the translatability of work that UKRN's developing to collaborators in the global south, for example? Uh, great question. And, you know, we hope in part um, that the institutions that are part of, you know, part of the, the case studies and the community of practice that Anna described, I guess, are bringing their own experience of collaboration and hopefully equitable collaborations into you know, the, the revisions that they're proposing for the, the materials there. Um, beyond that, and I don't know, Anna, if you wanted to add anything to that. Um, not really. I mean, it's a wider sort of EDI question, I think. I was wondering whether Alice had any thoughts on that. Yeah, so um, it's it's a great question. It's a really important question as well, and one we are thinking about a lot. And one of the things in the uh, con consultation phase of the uh, project, uh, we we talked to researchers, to uh, specialists in EDI about, was to expand our uh, idea of who we're thinking about. So protected characteristics, yes, because that's important and, and enshrined within in law of, of where we're based. But we wanted to expand that to other people who might be marginalized within the wider research community. And some of the thoughts that came up were around kind of people who'd moved to the UK, people with refugee status, people who were um, commuting very long distances. Now that's still within the UK context, but as we're starting to think about those topics and those areas, I'm hopeful that we'll have some impact on the wider uh, research community. We think a lot about um, research within the Global South. Uh, we don't wanna get ahead of ourselves too much, but it is, it's something that's kind of on our minds as we're thinking these things through. Again, this is quite a wishy-washy answer because we've, we've not got to the phase of kind of ac actioning uh, those things yet, but we're, we're definitely thinking about those things in part of the big, bigger picture. Yeah, it's a great question. Thanks, Andrew. I think, you know, we can, I think, draw from the expertise of uh, our partner institutions who are, as you would expect, collaborating internationally. But also we have a global reproducibility network. So there is an African reproducibility network. There's, there's one in Brazil and there are others elsewhere around the world. So we have an opportunity there that we haven't perhaps explored enough to take some of the developments that we're, we're pushing forward and to, to test those with, within those communities. So thanks for the question. It's a really helpful one. Oh, just to add one more thing as well. So one thing that we think a lot, particularly with the sharing and integrating team and the website work that, that we're doing is um, appropriate language and making sure that everything is as digestible as possible for people speaking English as a second language. We're generating resources in English 
that that's going to be the way that that goes forward uh, based on the UK reproducibility networks goals within the UK. But if we can make that as accessible as possible to people who don't speak English as a first language, then that will obviously benefit the wider community as well. Thanks, Alice. And I'm going to take that as a beautiful segue into Evangeline's uh, talk on the Living website. Um, so, Evangeline, would you like to update us on the work that's going on there? Yes. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Evangeline. I am the Orca Reddin. Um, I do not have any slides because I want to show you um, a couple of examples throughout this. So I thought it would just be easier. Um, obviously, through all of the talks so far, a lot of them have been saying, oh, and we need to be able to share this. Um, people need to be able to find things. So that's where we come in. Um, we have been looking at creating a living website since what I joined last September um, and at that point we were very much at requirements gathering um, and based on the requirements gathering um, we have come to a conclusion about exactly what we want the web living website to look like um, just to backtrack a little bit um, requirements gathering we did um, so my colleague who's no longer at the UKRN but her, she was Sid Anstey and she was at Southampton um, she did some user experience interviews um just about how people would what people would find easy to use then we did some kind of more broad requirements gathering about what people would need in a website on like a higher level um we did focus groups with orcas um researchers we got some of some from our colleagues in arma um and by talking to all those different stakeholders we gathered 22 different requirements that people had for a website. We then sorted those into something called Moscow, which is a computer science term, I think, um, which is when you sort your requirements into must have, should have, could have, and won't have. Um, based on that, we got all of the possible solutions we had um, in our group, which had a couple of, a lot of, well, all of us are open science professionals um, and some computer science professionals, those kind of things. And we managed to rate all of those requirements against all of the possible solutions we had. And the one that met all of our must have requirements, most of us should have, and quite a few of could was OER Commons, um, which stands for Open Educational Resources, which I know links into something that somebody was asking earlier. I'm afraid I don't remember who it was. Um, so I'll show you what OER Commons is um, as a broad, as a website in itself um, and then we'll talk a little bit about what our hub would look like. Um, unfortunately we don't have a mock-up of our of our hub um, at present. I won't go into the timeline details because I know Stephen has covered it earlier. Thank you Stephen for dealing with all that. I appreciate you. Um, so if I share my screen in general There we go. So um, this is OER Commons. I've just picked a couple of hubs. So we would have what's called a hub, um, which is basically where we get our own little help, um, homepage like this, the Alesco OER, um, or We Are The People. Um, you can see we'd have our logo here. Um, we'd be able to organize this however we want. We're thinking we'd obviously have the little input here, um, the little intro here. And then we'd have our organization at the top. Um, we're going to be dividing this so that people have, they've got member states. We would have these as um, the projects would all have their own web page. So that if you're going to go look specifically for OER, um, OR4, you could go to that area. If you wanted to look at EDI, you can go to that area. Um, the other thing that we're going to have is it's going to sort into collections. So if you didn't care about where something came from, you just wanted a open educational resource on, for example, pre-registration, you would be able to go in and go to a let's see if I can hear, collection, um, which is just, that would say pre-registration and it would be everything that everyone's uploaded about pre-registration. Um, now, I'll put a 
a little pause in that to explain um, the difference between groups and collections. Collections are literally, as you can see here, this is about nutrition. And it's just everything that people have uploaded about nutrition. Um, um, there's no interaction in this apart from you can upload if you want um, and you can download stuff, but it's not got any um, facilities for communicating with other people. Um, as opposed to a group, which is a bit of a more um, collaborative space, you can see there's discussions, um, members, recent activity um, and group resources. Now, to briefly pause, what we one of the main things that that people said, which makes total sense, um, is that we don't want it to just become like a hodgepodge of different things. Um, so we are going to have an administration approach. Um, the administration, I'm working with the different projects, um, the administrators for different collections. For the individual universities, it will probably be ORCAs. Um, for the projects, they've all nominated at least one administrator. And we're going to, as this is all going to be a progressive thing. So at, when we first launch, we're just expecting to have the initial um, topic, collections, the projects and individual university pages. Um, it might expand, in which case we'll have to expand the administration. But the idea is that people will be able to submit and somebody will be able to check that it's relevant, um, that it's up to date, um, and that it's not replicating something else that's already on there, that it's in the right place, just to make sure that it is easy. It's not absolutely full with things that you don't want to find and you have to keep scrolling through to find things that are actually useful. Um, the other thing that will be on there, quite a few projects, I think I know training and um, OR4 definitely are have community of practices. Um, we will have the option of hosting those on the website, but I know that both of those um, are to an extent established already and we don't want to force anybody to move on to a different thing. So the option will be there, but it is going to be down to the um, projects themselves to decide whether they want to do that. Um, now, the if you are in a situation where you would like to upload, because ultimately what we want this to be is somewhere where anyone can go and put the work that they're doing on open research into this space. Um, I'm going to use the example of the training team at the moment, just because I think that they're the ones that we're expecting the most input from to begin with. And they're the ones that we've had a lot of communication with. So for example, let's say you're one of those T1 trainers um, and you've created a PowerPoint on preprints and you want to put that onto our website there's two different ways that you can do that the first way is you can create it on the website they have a tool called open author which is specifically designed to create educational resources um, so you can do it directly there or alternatively you can link it in quite seamlessly from other areas that can just be it can be in pdf form it can be in a shareable um, powerpoint it could be that you have put it onto um um the open science framework, which I know that a lot of people are very familiar with. Um, and that's absolutely fine. It's very easy to link those things in, which is one of the main reasons that we picked OER Commons. Um, the final thing that I think would be worth commenting on here is just that we're quite we've used it we're quite we think it's quite easy um i know it's quite easy because quite a few people have told me and also because i know i was i initially i was saying um oh we're going to get guidance in order to put stuff up and i asked i wrote some guidance collected some stuff and then i asked a couple of colleagues to go and upload something to practice um and it took a little while and eventually they did it and they said, oh, that's so easy. Um, I didn't need to look at the guidance at all. And actually the fact that you were brought up guidance um, intimidated me into thinking it was gonna be a lot more complicated than it was. So for that reason, we're probably, we're gonna limit the amount of guidance we think just because we really don't think it's necessary. It will be there so that if you need help, you will be able to find it. There's um, a lot of, um, there's a couple of things. So, for example, when I tried to begin with my the resource I was trying to upload didn't have access set to everybody on Google Drive. So that took me forever. Um, so those kind of 
sticking points. We will have guidance on, we'll have frequent, frequently asked questions. Um, but generally speaking, we picked it because it's easy. We don't think that it's gonna require too much. And then the final thing is that a couple of places have, one thing it doesn't do is it doesn't create websites within the website. So it doesn't create like website pages. Um, if that is something you want to do, we do have an alternative solution um, and it's called Quarto. Um, and we, for people who really need it, we do have the facilities and the skills to help people create these things. And we have been creating some, um, there's a particularly good one with OR4. Um, so thank you, Anna and Robert for that. Um, we don't have that available to show you right now. So my colleague Lisa Debrine has very kindly um, created a very, very basic um, alternative that I can show you here. Um, and what she has stressed is that this is literally just a demonstration it doesn't look quite as clean as some of the other ones but you can see roughly what it would look like um this is what she's done here um as you can see um we've got our we've got the um heading at the top we've got the basic um description here she's explained to us that you can put in um text bubbles, glossaries, anything like that quite easily. So that facility is there and you can, we can produce that for you, um, but we do need quite a bit of advance notice on that if that's something that you want. So I would urge that if that is something you want, then please get in touch with us. Um, we can't just do this overnight for you. Um, and it's a kind of a limited, if the solution we've come up with does not solve what you need. Um, and I would like to thank Lisa massively for that one. And then lastly, all I'd like to comment on is that, um, uh, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you to Ree. So Sid, who's left, there's Alice, um, Louise, Stephen and Etienne who are working with us and they've been amazing for individual reasons that I don't have time to go into, but thank you very much um, for that. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Amazing, thank you, Evangeline. Um... So that's a really exciting thing that's coming up this autumn and any questions for Evangeline or suggestions as to how it might be of most use to the research community and the professional services communities that uh, we hope will be using it. I'll just rather than answer, I can answer Nikki. Would it be possible to see the requirements generated based on the feedback and needs? Yes, we do actually have this in a publicly shareable framework. We've got it in a, a you said, we said, you said we did, um, and I can work, I can get that to you and let me try and see if I can pop that in the chat. Okay, thank you. Uh, training team, who, who is it from the training team wants to come in? It's me, um, Evangeline. You may have covered this because I had to step out and go to the toilet. So you may have covered this whilst I was away. But um, did you cover the author, open authorship tool? Because I think that's a really exciting tool that's in OER Commons. It is. Um, and I mentioned it briefly. You might have been out of the room or I might not mentioned it in enough um, detail. But it's basically that's what I was talking about in that there's a um yeah an open author tool which is specifically designed for creating open educate open educational resources that are um it's like an online powerpoint but it's to create presentations but the exciting thing is then that you can remix it um very easily to just adjust to so say louise who is here has created something for southampton specifically you can then take it and just easily switch it up to be leads or reading or whatever it is um and either keep that privately or post that as the new one and again it is very very easy to use does that answer is that is there anything else in there that you think was more important for the open author tour that people need to know no okay cool excellent that's great thank you um Okay, I'm going to move us on if that's okay. I don't see any other questions coming in and I'm conscious that we're slightly running over time and I don't want to shortchange Lavinia, who we'll turn to now to talk about the evaluation uh, design project.
Thank you. So let's see. Okay, I hope you can see that. Um, oh, I can't see you now anymore. Um, okay, any... Yes, I hope you can see the screen. Um, we can't see the screen, Lavinia. Okay. Um, it went into like. Oh, oh, we now? can see it now. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, so yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lavinia, and I am within the evolution design um team. So I will first introduce the uh, team and then tell you a little bit about what the evaluation project is about and then a couple of slides on um, an update. So um, currently the evaluation design team is uh, made of Neil uh, Marcus, who is our um, project lead and he's also the institutional lead at uh, Bristol. Uh, then we have Bill, uh, who is our past project lead and institutional lead at the University of Liverpool, and he's still involved um, with the group. David, who is our incoming project lead, and he's also the institutional lead at University College London. I believe he will begin with us um, quite soon. And then uh, we have uh, the ORCAS. That's Alice, uh, who uh, you have uh, met today already. Uh, from the University of Liverpool, Ruth uh, from King's College London, Jackie uh, from Oxford, and myself uh, also from Bristol. And I'd like to take the opportunity to uh, thank the team as well. So, um, let's see if I can. Okay. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what the evaluation design um, project is about. Uh, as you can uh, gather, and also um, Alice has mentioned that before me as well, uh, it is about evaluating uh, the ORP. We have three main uh, aims, uh, which are to establish a baseline uh, for open research practices at partner institutions, um, identify changes in open research practices at these institutions over time, and begin to identify where these changes can be linked to interventions um, of the ORP. Uh, we have identified uh, three levels of evaluation. Um, the primary outcomes uh, or first level of evaluation uh, relates to evaluating the program itself. Um, so the question is, is there an increase in high quality open research practices? Then we have a second level of evaluation, um, which is about the project. And um, we developed this together with the project. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in the next slide. And the question is, have uh, each has each project met its smart objectives? And then there is a third level of evaluation, which is within the projects themselves. Um, and it is about, uh, it looks at, um how uh the how, how the ORP has engaged with uh the interventions of the projects the remit of the evaluation design um project is the first two levels of evaluation um but we are happy to help and support the projects uh who will handle the third level of evaluation now, the data that we base the evaluation on um, for the primary outcomes, so uh, at the program level, comes from the surveys that, again, I will uh, talk a little bit about in the next couple of slides, and the, um, um, oh, Neil, help me, um, indicators, sorry, the indicators project uh, that Neil will talk about. Uh, I believe after me. And then we have the uh, second level and the data from that comes from uh, the projects themselves. So um, what have we been up to? So um, we have developed a, uh, evalu an evaluation protocol which contains the information that I have just mentioned. 
uh, in the previous slide, um, but I'll tell you a little bit more about it. So this document uh, was developed together with the project and it outlines the methodology that uh, we want to use to evaluate um, the program and the project. Um, with regards to the project, we have um, begun this taking in, um, including training, reward and recognition, and sharing and integrating. Um, but if it becomes necessary, we will develop this protocol also for evaluation and management and sustainability. The reason why we pick these three first is because they have um, very defined interventions. So we, um, as I said, develop this uh, protocol together with the project. And we asked the project, uh, what are your SMART objectives? Uh, what do you plan to measure? And what kind of data uh, you plan to gather and how? From this document, uh, we went on and are about to finish um, producing some templates that we will share with the project, which they can use for the third level uh, of evaluation. So we hope to be able to support them with this. Um, we also created a data management plan uh, for specific for the evaluation design project, which is, of course, a living document, and we plan to update it regularly as well as publish it. And then uh, we uh, did a data collection pilot, um, which we ran throughout July. Um, basically, we asked the project to um, send us whatever data they had uh, in July. And the idea was to check uh, whether the data that uh, the project would send us, um, if, uh, let's say, if it was feasible for the project to collect the data the way that it was written in the evaluation protocol, um, if there were some issues um, that, that we could sort of arrange, discuss and then find solutions um, before we begin rolling out the data collections. Um, the last slide that I have is about the um, the survey. So the survey, uh, as I mentioned before, is one of the elements that will give us data about uh, for the first level of evaluation. So uh, understanding whether the ORP uh, has worked. And um, you might know that uh, there was already a survey done. Um, by the ORP in 2022-2023. Uh, the plan is to run another survey at the beginning of 25 and then a last one in 27. Of course, the, so, so the survey I'm um, going to talk about now is the 2025 one, so the next one. And the aim of the survey is um, to provide evidence of the changes in prevalence in open research practices. Now, some of you... Um, that are joining us today uh, may have received uh, from Neil a brief which contains um, what we think about what, what we will what we would like the survey to sort of look like, uh, what the aims are, the key features, some more information about what I'm telling you now. Um, and there are some additional key features, but uh, of the survey. But I want to highlight um, a couple. We aim for a representative sample uh, using a stratified sampling approach. Um, the previous survey uh, that was conducted in 2022-2023, uh, uh, um, different institutions uh, ran it differently. Um, so we would like as much as possible to um, use a stratified sampling to be able to um, get a representative sample throughout uh, all the partner institutions that will run the, the survey. And then um, uh, mostly Alice in our team uh, is um, working on um, using language that is consistent uh, with other surveys. Um, that would be massively helpful to enable comparisons. We would like to be able to compare the data that we gather from the survey uh, with the, um, to the, data that we collected from the previous survey, as well as with other surveys, um, such as BORS, uh, which I believe stands for Brief Open Research Survey. Um, and so it would be very helpful to be able to compare uh, the data that we get with how we did previously, 
um, as well as uh, surveys that are rolled out uh, not uh, to partner institutions. So to see if there are any differences. And on the right here, I have a brief um, uh, run through the timeline. Um, I'm not going to go through it, uh, but you can read at your own time. But briefly, uh, we have started working on this in August uh, when uh, Neil shared the brief I just mentioned with some more information and the plans about how to run the survey. And then um, th the the plan is to run the survey in, to open up the survey in February. So before that, uh, we will of course um, set up the survey and involve the partners. Uh, and the um, survey will, uh, I believe, stay open for about a month or so and then uh, maybe two, and then um, close the survey and gather the, gather the data, analyze them, and hopefully be able to share with you the results um, around July. I think that's all for me. So um, thanks again for this opportunity and happy to take questions. Amazing, thanks Lavinia. What I think I might do is I might skip through the, the indicators work as well, and then see if there's any questions on, on those two things combined. Um, and I'm going to skip through that really rapidly, if that's okay. Um, so this is the sort of the, what complements the survey that just Lavinia just talked about. Um, we, in our proposal, suggested that we might be able to use automated systems of various kinds, so ORCID was mentioned in the bid, to monitor the changes in uptake and open research practices. Uh, and so we're investigating these in, in uh, various sorts of ways. We polled the sector to find out what their priorities would be for monitoring open research last year. Uh, and luckily the priorities they came up with very much align with the sorts of changes that we are hoping to make through, for example, the, the training work and the reward and recognition work. So these are the sorts of practices we're hoping to, to improve reward and recognition for, that we're hoping to improve skills for as part of the program. And so if we can measure using indicators as well as using the survey changes in these, then you know that would be a, a useful set of evidence for us in the program. So use for data availability statements, sharing data, you know, um, and the effects of sharing data, the use of uh, credit for contributor recognition and the use of pre-registration are the topics that we're running in these um, indicator pilots for. They are pilots. They're, the aim of these pilots is to identify what good looks like when you're monitoring these things. Uh, that is a non-trivial question, as many of you will understand. Uh, and uh, we are finding out the details of just how non-trivial that question is as we go through the pilots. Um, they're being led by a group of institutions, and there you can see that list of institutions there, and a group of uh, providers, if you like, so sort of information providers, all of whom are, are doing this on a voluntary basis, and that brings its own uh, advantages and disadvantages to the ways in which we're doing it. But it does show the level of interest, I think, across the sector in trying to, to find good ways of measuring these things over time. Um, so a little run through of what our timeline is on, on the indicators. Uh, we, we've identified the priorities that we want to run. We have now got these pilots up and running. They, are, uh, they have developed data sets. They have developed data sets from institutional data and, and from working with those, those providers. Um, we are now exploring in each of those uh, pilots in different sorts of ways how we might use some of those data to, to indicate uh, changes over time and, and states of affairs with respect to those particular aspects of open research. We're bringing in uh, some help to make sure that we're doing this in the right sort of way. So we're going to work with uh, the CWS team at Leiden University to do some quality assurance. Uh, and then towards the end of the work, which will be in the first quarter, I think, of next year now, uh, we're going to have some major communication and engagement work to make sure that we both you know, tell people what we've done and, and what we found, but also understand how that relates to other work that's been going on um, and how that might, you know, usefully land. The idea really is if we can identify good practice in at least some of these, and measurement of data availability statements is probably the one I'd look most closely at in the first instance, that we'd hope that the, the partner institutions and the Open Research Programme would take up that practice uh, over the course of the rest of the programme, and therefore we'd have data on those things uh, to complement the survey. So that is where we are on the indicator work. Uh, so any questions both on what Lavinia said and on what I quickly skipped through there?
No, it was a bit of a whistle stop tour, but um, let's give uh, another few seconds for people to have a think about whether or not they want to ask a question about that. No, okay, that's fine. Uh, conscious we're running short of time. Um, we may be squeezing out the general Q&A that I was hoping to have at the end. Um, but there's a lot going on. So I'm going to therefore go straight on to the sustainability work, which is part of the sort of, as you might expect, the management and sustainability project, which I'm leading. Uh, and the aim of this really is to develop a sustainability model for, for the UK reproducibility network, which has no core funding. Uh, we have no core staff that are sort of funded in an ongoing kind of way and no core infrastructure. We're hosted by the University of Bristol at the moment, which is which is great, and we thank Bristol for that. But everything UKRN does is either done by volunteers, so you might highlight local network leads, but also some of the orcas that are part of the programme, um, or by project funding. And the Open Research Programme is clearly one of those projects, but we have other projects as well. So, you know, that model is, has done us fine for our first five years as UKRN, um, but it's not intrinsically sustainable and it does have particular kinds of drawbacks. So what is the future model for, for UK and how can we keep ourselves going if we think what we're doing is valuable and I think we do, then how can we, uh, how can we build that so that it's uh, resilient into the future? So um, the Open Research Programme is a collaboration of, of institutions, so um, that's one part of UKRN and is perhaps the lens that we'll look at sustainability through, through the, the Open Research Programme, but we do need to remember that the UKRN also includes both grassroots researcher networks through the local networks and also stakeholders, so research funders and publishers and others, and we will need to look at our sustainability through those lenses as well. The way that we're working on it at the moment, and this is an update, and I, you know, I haven't got news for you here, but I've got plans. Um, we have a project ongoing, uh, which is just picking up now that I'm leading, uh, with, with four parts. The first of which is to work out, you know, what is the UKRN's value proposition for our members? What do we do as a group of uh, people uh, and institutions and organisations that gives our cell, you know, gives value to ourselves and our institutions and organisations. So we will be developing and running a survey this autumn to really nail that down, to really identify what what those things are and what those priorities are. So we've got a shared understanding of those among all those communities within the UK Reproducibility Network. Uh, the second thing we'll be doing, uh, and we haven't started this yet, is by thinking about the ways in which UKRN as a platform enables us to recognize contributions of, of, our, of our members uh, and uh, those, those around us. So how do we recognize the contributions that our local network leads create? How do we recognize the contributions that our institutions make in ways that are meaningful to them and you know, motivating perhaps uh, for them and ways that they might be able to, to sort of use in various sorts of ways? Um, so that's work that uh, I'm quite excited about. I think there's a really interesting set of questions in there. Um, and so be really keen for anybody who's interested in working with me on that to, to let me know, because I think there's, uh, as I say, there's some really interesting questions. Uh, the third part of the work is to look specifically at the Open Research Programme. And Tim's already mentioned the training as one key aspect of that, that we would probably like to sustain in some way and really do some targeted work around that. And then the fourth part of the work is, is then to develop some, some business models and sustainability models for UK and as a whole, and to test those with our members and potential members to make sure that those things are both acceptable and, and fit for purpose. So we're aiming to do that over the course of the next year or so, um, and we will obviously keep you informed as we do. So another little whistle stop tour. I hope that was interesting and useful. Any thoughts or questions around the work that we're doing around sustainability? It's been a long meeting. I think people might simply uh, have had information overload possibly. Any other questions about anything that you've heard any comments on what you've heard are we going in the right direction are there things obvious gaps where we're you know just not doing the things that we should be doing 
things that we should be paying attention to out there in the wider community that, that we haven't mentioned? Andrew? Yeah, um, sorry, it's me again. Um, the I, I just wondered if somewhere you have a um, maybe survey data of what the disciplinary balance is within the, the orcas or people who are engaging with UKRN. Um, because as, as far as I understand it, it was a, a you know, an, an initiative which was originated in biomedical science. Um, so I just wondered, you know, where, where are you now? And um, it, particularly uh, in the training provision, uh, what's the relationship with um, Elixir UK, the um, European platform for bioinformatics, which has a huge training component? Yeah, thanks. Two great questions there. Uh, Adam, just to pre-warn you, I'm going to come to you on the Elixir question. Um, but on the first question, yeah, absolutely. UKRN did come out of uh, the biosciences, life sciences and psychology um, with a history of the reproducibility crisis that I think everybody on the call probably is aware of. Um, we are uh, extending out of that now. Uh, you know, we have um, Lee Darts University has just joined us uh, as a, with a local network lead, which is, you know, I'm really excited about. We have um, run events bringing together psychologists and arts practice researchers. Uh, some of the training that we're delivering uh, in November, we hope, will be around research co-production and, uh, and, and certainly things that are relevant to qualitative research. Um, so we are working on that. There is a, a paper uh, uh, going to the supervisory board next week, which proposes work that we might do um, to convene national level conversations about, you know, the sorts of things that we talk about in, in the UKRN things like rigor and transparency and reproducibility and the ways in which those uh, are talked about in other disciplines and try to learn from each other. So can we convene national conversations where we get greater mutual understanding of those things, um, perhaps with um, academies or learned societies or research councils and other sorts of ways. So yeah, um, there's work for us to do there. So Andrew, that is, um, that is very much work in progress, uh, but thank you for the question. Um, Adam, can you talk about Elixir, please? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, sort yeah. of. Okay. Um, so I must be honest, I did miss the question, but I can speak a little bit about, um, so um, I'm working with the, the training project primarily with the UKRN, um, but then I also recently got the Elixir UK uh, Data Stewardship Fellowship as well. So I've kind of acted as a bit of a link between Elixir and, and UKRN kind of specifically. Um, I know at the start of the program, uh, there was a webinar, a co-hosted webinar with UKRN and Elixir UK. Um, and, and like I said, going forward, I've kind of find that link. Um, and I, yeah, I, I agree with Neil. There's, there's definitely work to be done linking with, with other people uh, more, more broadly, especially with things like Biofair, um, which is you know, going to be a big thing moving forward in, in the life sciences. Um, yeah, just to give a bit of background of how I kind of link, link between the two. And will we be, um, do you think we'll be highlighting some of the Elixir training in, in, the, in the open research program training, Adam? Is that something that we might uh, get closer to together on? Yeah, yeah, I can definitely see that. Um, so again, just speaking from, from my experience um, with the fellowship, um, that was around creating training materials, obviously more specific to life sciences. Um, and again, there's, yeah, there, there's lots of ways that they can be linked together. I could definitely see them being more links going forward as well. Amazing, thank you. Right, conscious it's two minutes to three, uh, and many of us would perhaps like to get a coffee before our next meeting. If there's no other questions or comments, and I'm just gonna check the chat to make sure that that is the case. I'm gonna suggest that we close now. That's been really interesting. Thank you very much for your feedback, comments, and questions. Um, and uh, the, um, I think this recording will be made available, won't it, Dolly, at some point reasonably soon? Yeah, it should be within a week that I'll um, circulate it to all the registrants, so you'll get that. Amazing. Thank you. Thanks very much for your time. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care.